chapter one of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by his son this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales recollections and letters of general robert e lee by his son captain robert e lee jr chapter one services in the united states army captain lee of the engineers a hero to his child the family pets home from the mexican war three years in baltimore superintendent of the west point military academy lieutenant colonel of second cavalry suppresses john brown raid at harper's ferry commands the department of texas the first vivid recollection i have of my father is his arrival at arlington after his return from the mexican war i can remember some events of which he seemed a part when we lived at fort hamilton new york about eighteen forty six but they are more like dreams very indistinct and disconnected naturally so for i was at that time about three years old but the day of his return to arlington after an absence of more than two years i have always remembered i had a frock or blouse of some light wash material probably cotton a blue ground dotted over with white diamond figures of this i was very proud and wanted to wear it on this important occasion eliza my mammy objecting we had a contest and i won clothed in this my very best and with my hair freshly curled in long golden ringlets i went down into the large hall where the whole household was assembled eagerly greeting my father who had just arrived on horseback from washington having missed in some way the carriage which had been sent for him there was visiting us at this time mrs lippett a friend of my mother's with her little boy Armistead, about my age and size and also with long curls whether he wore as handsome a suit as mine i cannot remember but he and i were left together in the background feeling rather frightened and awed after a moment's greeting to those surrounding him my father pushed through the crowd exclaiming where is my little boy he then took up in his arms and kissed not me his own child in his best frock with clean face and well-arranged curls but my little playmate armistead i remember nothing more of any circumstances connected with that time save that i was shocked and humiliated i have no doubt that he was at once informed of his mistake and made ample amends to me a letter from my father to his brother captain s s lee united states navy dated arlington june thirty eighteen forty eight tells of his coming home here i am once again my dear smith perfectly surrounded by mary and her precious children who seem to devote themselves to staring at the furrows in my face and the white hairs in my head it is not surprising that i am hardly recognizable to some of the young eyes around me and perfectly unknown to the youngest but some of the older ones gaze with astonishment and wonder at me and seem at a loss to reconcile what they see and what was pictured in their imaginations i find them too much grown and all well and i have much cause for thankfulness and gratitude to that good god who has once more united us my next recollection of my father is in baltimore while we were on a visit to his sister mrs marshall the wife of judge marshall i remember being down on the wharves where my father had taken me to see the landing of a mustang pony which he had gotten for me in mexico and which had been shipped from vera cruz to baltimore in a sailing vessel i was all eyes for the pony and a very miserable sad-looking object he was from his long voyage cramped quarters and unavoidable lack of grooming he was rather a disappointment to me but i soon got over all that as i grew older and was able to ride and appreciate him he became the joy and pride of my life i was taught to ride on him by jim connolly the faithful irish servant of my father who had been with him in mexico jim used often to tell me in his quizzical way that he and santa anna the pony's name were the first men on the walls of chapultepec this pony was pure white five years old and about fourteen hands high 
for his inches he was as good a horse as i ever have seen while we lived in baltimore he and grace darling my father's favourite mare were members of our family grace darling was a chestnut of fine size and of great power which he had bought in texas on his way out to mexico her owner having died on the march out she was with him during the entire campaign and was shot seven times at least as a little fellow i used to brag about that number of bullets being in her and since i could point out the scars of each one i presume it was so my father was very much attached to and proud of her always petting her and talking to her in a loving way when he rode her or went to see her in her stall of her he wrote on his return home i only arrived yesterday after a long journey up the mississippi which route i was induced to take for the better accommodation of my horse as i wished to spare her as much annoyance and fatigue as possible she already having undergone so much suffering in my service i landed her at wheeling and left her to come over with jim santa anna was found lying cold and dead in the park at arlington one morning in the winter of sixty sixty one grace darling was taken in the spring of sixty two from the white house footnote my brother's place on the pamunkey river where the mare had been sent for safe keeping and note by some federal quartermaster when mcclellan occupied that place as his base of supplies during his attack on richmond when we lived in baltimore i was greatly struck one day by hearing two ladies who were visiting us saying everybody and everything his family his friends his horse and his dog loves colonel lee the dog referred to was a black and tan terrier named speck very bright and intelligent and really a member of the family respected and beloved by ourselves and well known to all who knew us my father picked up his mother in the narrows while crossing from fort hamilton to the fortifications opposite on staten island she had doubtless fallen overboard from some passing vessel and had drifted out of sight before her absence had been discovered he rescued her and took her home where she was welcomed by his children and made much of she was a handsome little thing with cropped ears and a short tail my father named her dart she was a fine ratter and with the assistance of a maltese cat also a member of the family the many rats which infested the house and stables were driven away or destroyed she and the cat were fed out of the same plate but dart was not allowed to begin the meal until the cat had finished speck was born at fort hamilton and was the joy of us children our pet and companion my father would not allow his tail and ears to be cropped when he grew up he accompanied us everywhere and was in the habit of going into church with the family as some of the little ones allowed their devotions to be disturbed by speck's presence my father determined to leave him at home on those occasions so the next sunday morning he was sent up to the front room of the second story after the family had left for church he contented himself for a while looking out of the window which was open it being summer time presently impatience overcame his judgment and he jumped to the ground landed safely notwithstanding the distance joined the family just as they reached the church and went in with them as usual much to the joy of the children after that he was allowed to go to church whenever he wished my father was very fond of him and loved to talk to him and about him as if he were really one of us in a letter to my mother dated fort hamilton january eighteenth eighteen forty six when she and her children were on a visit to arlington he thus speaks of him i am very solitary and my only company is my dog and cats but speck has become so jealous now that he will hardly let me look at the cats he seems to be afraid that i am going off from him and never lets me stir without him lies down in the office from eight to four without moving and turns himself before the fire as the side from it becomes cold i catch him sometimes sitting up looking at me so intently that i am for a moment startled in a letter from mexico written a year later december twenty fifth eighteen forty six to my mother he says can't you cure poor speck cheer him up take him to walk with you and tell the children to cheer him up 
in another letter from mexico to his eldest boy just after the capture of veracruz he sends this message to speck tell him i wish he was here with me he would have been of great service in telling me when i was coming upon the mexicans when i was reconnoitring around vera cruz their dogs frequently told me by barking when i was approaching them too nearly when he returned to arlington from mexico speck was the first to recognize him and the extravagance of his demonstrations of delight left no doubt that he knew at once his kind master and loving friend though he had been absent three years some time during our residence in baltimore speck disappeared and we never knew his fate from that early time i began to be impressed with my father's character as compared with other men every member of the household respected revered and loved him as a matter of course but it began to dawn on me that every one else with whom i was thrown held him high in their regard at forty-five years of age he was active strong and as handsome as he had ever been i never remember his being ill i presume he was indisposed at time but no impressions of that kind remain he was always bright and gay with us little folk romping playing and joking with us with the older children he was just as companionable and i have seen him join my elder brothers and their friends when they would try their powers at a high jump put up in our yard the two younger children he petted a great deal and our greatest treat was to get into his bed in the morning and lie close to him listening while he talked to us in his bright entertaining way this custom we kept up until i was ten years old and over although he was so joyous and familiar with us he was very firm on all proper occasions never indulged us in anything that was not good for us and exacted the most implicit obedience i always knew that it was impossible to disobey my father i felt it in me i never thought why but was perfectly sure when he gave an order that it had to be obeyed my mother i could sometimes circumvent and at times took liberties with her orders construing them to suit myself but exact obedience to every mandate of my father was a part of my life and being at that time he was very fond of having his hands tickled and what was still more curious it pleased and delighted him to take off his slippers and place his feet in our laps in order to have them tickled often as little things after romping all day the enforced sitting would be too much for us and our drowsiness would soon show itself in continued nods then to arouse us he had a way of stirring us up with his foot laughing heartily at and with us he would often tell us the most delightful stories and then there was no nodding sometimes however our interest in his wonderful tales became so engrossing that we would forget to do our duty when he would declare no tickling no story when we were a little older our elder sister told us one winter the ever delightful lady of the lake of course she told it in prose and arranged it to suit our mental capacity our father was generally in his corner by the fire most probably with a foot in either lap of myself or youngest sister the tickling going on briskly and would come in at different points of the tale and repeat line after line of the poem much to our disapproval but to his great enjoyment in january eighteen forty nine captain lee was one of a board of army officers appointed to examine the coasts of florida and its defences and to recommend locations for new fortifications in april he was assigned to the duty of the construction of fort carroll in the patapsco river below baltimore he was there i think for three years and lived in a house on madison street three doors above biddle i used to go down with him to the fort quite often we went to the wharf in a bus and there we were met by a boat with two oarsmen who rowed us down to sollers point where i was generally left under the care of the people who lived there while my father went over to the fort a short distance out in the river these days were very happy ones for me 
the wharves the shipping the river the boat and oarsmen and the country dinner we had at the house at sollers point all made a strong impression on me but above all i remember my father his gentle loving care of me his bright talk his stories his maxims and teachings i was very proud of him and of the evident respect for and trust in him every one showed these impressions obtained at that time have never left me he was a great favourite in baltimore as he was everywhere especially with ladies and little children when he and my mother went out in the evening to some entertainment we were often allowed to sit up and see them off my father as i remember always in full uniform always ready and waiting for my mother who was generally late he would chide her gently in a playful way and with a bright smile he would then bid us good-bye and i would go to sleep with this beautiful picture in my mind the golden epaulets and all chiefly the epaulets in baltimore i went to my first school that of a mr rawlins on mulberry street and i remember how interested my father was in my studies my failures and my little triumphs indeed he was so always as long as i was at school and college and i can only wish that all of the kind sensible useful letters he wrote me had been preserved my memory as to the move from baltimore which occurred in eighteen fifty two is very dim i think the family went to arlington to remain until my father had arranged for our removal to the new home at west point my recollection of my father as superintendent of the west point military academy is much more distinct he lived in the house which is still occupied by the superintendent it was built of stone large and roomy with gardens stables and pasture lots we the two youngest children enjoyed it all grace darling and santa anna were there with us and many a fine ride did i have with my father in the afternoons when released from his office he would mount his old mare and with santa anna carrying me by his side take a five or ten mile trot though the pony cantered delightfully he would make me keep him in a trot saying playfully that the hammering i sustained was good for me we rode the dragoon seat no posting and until i became accustomed to it i used to be very tired by the time i got back my father was the most punctual man i ever knew he was always ready for family prayers for meals and met every engagement social or business at the moment he expected all of us to be the same and taught us the use and necessity of forming such habits for the convenience of all concerned i never knew him late for sunday service at the post chapel he used to appear some minutes before the rest of us in uniform jokingly rallying my mother for being late and for forgetting something at the last moment when he could wait no longer for her he would say that he was off and would march along to church by himself or with any of the children who were ready there he sat very straight well up the middle aisle and as i remember always became very sleepy and sometimes even took a little nap during the sermon at that time this drowsiness of my father's was something awful to me inexplicable i know it was very hard for me to keep awake and frequently i did not but why he who to my mind could do everything that was right without any effort should sometimes be overcome i could not understand and did not try to do so it was against the rules that the cadets should go beyond certain limits without permission of course they did go sometimes and when caught were given quite a number of demerits my father was riding out one afternoon with me and while rounding a turn in the mountain road with a deep woody ravine on one side we came suddenly upon three cadets far beyond the limits they immediately leaped over a low wall on the side of the road and disappeared from our view we rode on for a minute in silence and then my father said did you know those young men but no if you did don't say so i wish boys would do what is right it would be so much easier for all parties he knew he would have to report them but not being sure of who they were i presume he wished to give them the benefit of the doubt at any rate i never heard any more about it one of the three asked me next day if my father had recognized them and i told him what had occurred 
by this time i had become old enough to have a room to myself and to encourage me in being useful and practical my father made me attend to it just as the cadets had to do with their quarters in barracks and in camp he at first even went through the form of inspecting it to see if i had performed my duty properly and i think i enjoyed this until the novelty wore off however i was kept at it becoming in time very proficient and the knowledge so acquired has been of great use to me all through life my father always encouraged me in every healthy outdoor exercise and sport he taught me to ride constantly giving me minute instructions with the reasons for them he gave me my first sled and sometimes used to come out where we boys were coasting to look on he gave me my first pair of skates and placed me in the care of a trustworthy person inquiring regularly how i progressed it was the same with swimming which he was very anxious i should learn in a proper manner professor bailey had a son about my age now himself a professor at brown university providence rhode island who became my great chum i took my first lesson in the water with him under the direction and supervision of his father my father inquired constantly how i was getting along and made me describe exactly my method and stroke explaining to me what he considered the best way to swim and the reasons therefor i went to a day school at west point and had always a sympathetic helper in my father often he would come into the room where i studied at night and sitting down by me would show me how to overcome a hard sentence in my latin reader or a difficult sum in arithmetic not by giving me the translation of the troublesome sentence or the answer to the sum but by showing me step by step the way to the right solutions he was very patient very loving very good to me and i remember trying my best to please him in my studies when i was able to bring home a good report from my teacher he was greatly pleased and showed it in his eye and voice but he always insisted that i should get the maximum that he would never be perfectly satisfied with less that i did sometimes win it deservedly i know was due to his judicious and wise method of exciting my ambition and perseverance i have endeavoured to show how fond my father was of his children and as the best picture i can offer of his loving tender devotion to us all i give here a letter from him written about this time to one of his daughters who was staying with our grandmother mrs custis in arlington west point february twenty five eighteen fifty three my precious annie i take advantage of your gracious permission to write to you and there is no telling how far my feelings might carry me were i not limited by the conveyance furnished by the mim's letter which lies before me and which must the mim says so go in this morning's mail footnote mim's his pet name for my mother End note. But my limited time does not diminish my affection for you, Annie, nor prevent my thinking of you and wishing for you. I long to see you through the dilatory nights. At dawn, when I rise, and all day, my thoughts revert to you in expressions that you cannot hear or I repeat. I hope you will always appear to me as you are now painted on my heart, and that you will endeavor to improve and so conduct yourself as to make you happy and me joyful all our lives diligent and earnest attention to all your duties can only accomplish this i am told you are growing very tall and i hope very straight i do not know what the cadets will say if the superintendent's children do not practice what he demands of them they will naturally say he had better attend to his own before he corrects other people's children and as he permits his to stoop it is hard he will not allow them you and agnes footnote his third daughter end note, must not therefore bring me into discredit with my young friends or give them reason to think that i require more of them than of my own i presume your mother has told all about us our neighbours and our affairs and indeed she may have done that and not said much either so far as i know but we are all well and have much to be grateful for to-morrow we anticipate the pleasure of your brother's company footnote his son custis end note 
which is always a source of pleasure to us it is the only time we see him except when the corps comes under my view at some of their exercises when my eye is sure to distinguish him among his comrades and follow him over the plain give much love to your dear grandmother grandfather agnes miss sue lucretia and all friends including the servants write sometimes and think always of your affectionate father r e lee in a letter to my mother written many years previous to this time he says i pray god to watch over and direct our efforts in guarding our dear little son oh what pleasure i lose in being separated from my children nothing can compensate me for that in another letter of about the same time you do not know how much i have missed you and the children my dear mary to be alone in a crowd is very solitary in the woods i feel sympathy with the trees and birds in whose company i take delight but experience no pleasure in a strange crowd i hope you are all well and will continue so and therefore must again urge you to be very prudent and careful of those dear children if i could only get a squeeze at that little fellow turning up his sweet mouth to quiche baba you must not let him run wild in my absence and will have to exercise firm authority over all of them this will not require severity or even strictness but constant attention and an unwavering course mildness and forbearance will strengthen their affection for you while it will maintain your control over them in a letter to one of his sons he writes as follows i cannot go to bed my dear son without writing you a few lines to thank you for your letter which gave me great pleasure you and custis must take great care of your kind mother and dear sisters when your father is dead to do that you must learn to be good be true kind and generous and pray earnestly to god to enable you to keep his commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life i hope to come on soon to see that little baby you have got to show me you must give her a kiss for me and one to all the children to your mother and grandmother the expression of such sentiments as these was common to my father all through his life and to show that it was all children and not his own little folk alone that charmed and fascinated him i quote from a letter to my mother i saw a number of little girls all dressed up in their white frocks and pantalettes their hair plaited and tied up with ribbons running and chasing each other in all directions i counted twenty-three nearly the same size as i drew up my horse to admire the spectacle a man appeared at the door with the twenty-fourth in his arms my friend said i are all these your children yes he said and there are nine more in the house and this is the youngest upon further inquiry however i found that they were only temporarily his and that they were invited to a party at his house he said however he had been admiring them before i came up and just wished that he had a million of dollars and that they were all his in reality i do not think the eldest exceeded seven or eight years old it was the prettiest sight i have seen in the west and perhaps in my life as superintendent of the military academy at west point my father had to entertain a great deal and i remember well how handsome and grand he looked in uniform how genial and bright how considerate of everybody's comfort of mind and body he was always a great favorite with the ladies especially the young ones his fine presence his gentle courteous manners and kindly smile put them at once at ease with him among the cadets at this time were my eldest brother custis who graduated first in his class in eighteen fifty four and my father's nephew fitz lee a third classman besides other relatives and friends saturday being a half holiday for the cadets it was the custom for all social events in which they were to take part to be placed on that afternoon or evening nearly every saturday a number of these young men were invited to our house to tea or supper for it was a good substantial meal the misery of some of these lads owing to embarrassment possibly from awe of the superintendent was pitiable and evident even to me a boy of ten or eleven years old but as soon as my father got command as it were of the situation one could see how quickly most of them were put at their ease 
he would address himself to the task of making them feel comfortable and at home and his genial manner and pleasant ways at once succeeded in the spring of eighteen fifty three my grandmother mrs custis died this was the first death in our immediate family she was very dear to us and was admired esteemed and loved by all who had ever known her bishop meade of virginia writes of her mrs mary custis of arlington the wife of mr washington custis grandson of mrs general washington was the daughter of mr william fitzhugh of chatham scarcely is there a christian lady in our land more honoured than she was and none more loved and esteemed for good sense prudence sincerity benevolence unaffected piety disinterested zeal in every good work deep humanity and retiring modesty for all the virtues which adorn the wife the mother and the friend i never knew her superior in a letter written to my mother soon after this sad event my father says may god give you strength to enable you to bear and say his will be done she has gone from all trouble care and sorrow to a holy immortality there to rejoice and praise for ever the god and saviour she so long and truly served let that be our comfort and that our consolation may our death be like hers and may we meet in happiness in heaven in another letter about the same time he writes she was to me all that a mother could be and i yield to none in admiration for her character love for her virtues and veneration for her memory at this time my father's family and friends persuaded him to allow r s weir a professor of painting and drawing at the academy to paint his portrait as far as i remember there was only one sitting and the artist had to finish it from memory or from the glimpses he obtained of his subject in the regular course of their daily lives at the point this picture shows my father in the undress uniform of a colonel of engineers and many think it a very good likeness footnote his appointment of superintendent of the military academy carried with it the temporary rank of colonel of engineers End note to me the expression of strength peculiar to his face is wanting and the mouth fails to portray that sweetness of disposition so characteristic of his countenance still it was like him at that time my father never could bear to have his picture taken and there are no likenesses of him that really give his sweet expression sitting for a picture was such a serious business with him that he never could look pleasant in eighteen fifty five my father was appointed to the lieutenant colonelcy of the second cavalry one of the two regiments just raised he left west point to enter upon his new duties and his family went to arlington to live during the fall and winter of eighteen fifty five and fifty six the second cavalry was recruited and organized at jefferson barracks missouri under the direction of colonel lee and in the following spring was marched to western texas where it was assigned the duty of protecting the settlers in that wild country i did not see my father again until he came to my mother at arlington after the death of her father g w p custis in october eighteen fifty seven he took charge of my mother's estate after her father's death and commenced at once to put it in order not an easy task as it consisted of several plantations and many negroes i was at a boarding-school after the family returned to arlington and saw my father only during the holidays if he happened to be at home he was always fond of farming and took great interest in the improvements he immediately began at arlington relating to the cultivation of the farm to the buildings roads fences fields and stock so that in a very short time the appearance of everything on the estate was improved he often said that he longed for the time when he could have a farm of his own where he could end his days in quiet and peace interested in the care and improvement of his own land this idea was always with him in a letter to his son written in july eighteen sixty five referring to some proposed indictment of prominent confederates he says 
as soon as i can ascertain their intention toward me if not prevented i shall endeavour to procure some humble but quiet abode for your mother and sisters where i hope they can be happy as i before said i want to get in some grass country where the natural product of the land will do much for my subsistence again in a letter to his son dated october eighteen sixty five after he had accepted the presidency of washington college lexington virginia i should have selected a more quiet life and a more retired abode than lexington i should have preferred a small farm where i could have earned my daily bread about this time i was given a gun of my own and was allowed to go shooting by myself my father to give me an incentive offered a reward for every crow scalp i could bring him and in order that i might get to work at once advanced a small sum with which to buy powder and shot this sum to be returned to him out of the first scalps obtained my industry and zeal were great my hopes high and by good luck i did succeed in bagging two crows about the second time i went out i showed them with great pride to my father intimating that i should shortly be able to return him his loan and that he must be prepared to hand over to me very soon further rewards for my skill his eyes twinkled and his smile showed that he had strong doubts of my making an income by killing crows and he was right for i never killed another though i tried hard and long i saw but little of my father after we left west point he went to texas as i have stated in eighteen fifty five and remained until the fall of eighteen fifty seven the time of my grandfather's death he was then at arlington about a year returning to his regiment he remained in texas until the autumn of eighteen fifty nine when he came again to arlington having applied for leave in order to finish the settling of my grandfather's estate during this visit he was selected by the secretary of war to suppress the famous john brown raid and was sent to harper's ferry in command of the united states troops from his memorandum book the following entries are taken october seventeenth eighteen fifty nine received orders from the secretary of war in person to repair in evening train to harper's ferry reached harper's ferry at eleven p m posted marines in the united states armory waited until daylight as a number of citizens were held as hostages whose lives were threatened tuesday about sunrise with twelve marines under lieutenant green broke in the door of the engine house secured the insurgents and relieved the prisoners unhurt all the insurgents killed or mortally wounded but four john brown stevens copy and shields brown was tried and convicted and sentenced to be hanged on december second eighteen fifty nine colonel lee writes as follows to his wife harper's ferry december one eighteen fifty nine i arrived here dearest mary yesterday about noon with four companions from fort monroe and was busy all the evening and night getting accommodation for the men and so forth and posting sentinels and pickets to ensure timely notice of the approach of the enemy the night has passed off quietly the feelings of the community seem to be calmed down and i have been received with every kindness mr fry is among the officers from old point there are several young men former acquaintances of ours as cadets mr bingham of custis's class sam cooper etc but the senior officers i never met before except captain howe the friend of our cousin harriet r i presume we are fixed here till after the sixteenth to-morrow will probably be the last of captain brown there will be less interest for the others but still i think the troops will not be withdrawn till they are similarly disposed of custis will have informed you that i had to go to baltimore the evening i left you to make arrangements for the transportation for the troops this morning i was introduced to mrs brown who with a mrs tyndall and a mr and mrs mckim all from philadelphia had come on to have a last interview with her husband as it is a matter over which i have no control i referred them to general tolliver footnote general william b tolliver commanding virginia troops at harper's ferry End note. 
you must write to me at this place i hope you are all well give love to everybody tell smith footnote sydney smith lee of the united states navy his brother End note. tell smith that no charming women have insisted on taking care of me as they are always doing of him i am left to my own resources i will write you again soon and will always be truly and affectionately yours mrs m c lee r e lee in february eighteen sixty he was ordered to take command of the department of texas there he remained a year the first months after his arrival were spent in the vain pursuit of the famous brigand cortinez who was continually stealing across the rio grande burning the homes driving off the stock of the ranchmen and then retreating into mexico the summer months he spent in san antonio and while there interested himself with the good people of that town in building an episcopal church to which he contributed largely End of chapter 1chapter two of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by robert e lee jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the confederate general resigns from colonelcy of first u s cavalry motives for this step chosen to command virginia forces anxiety about his wife family and possessions chief adviser to president davis battle of manassas military operations in west virginia letter to state governor in february eighteen sixty one after the succession of texas my father was ordered to report to general scott the commander-in-chief of the united states army he immediately relinquished the command of his regiment and departed from fort mason texas for washington he reached arlington march first april seventeenth virginia seceded on the eighteenth colonel lee had a long interview with general scott on april twentieth he tendered his resignation of his commission in the united states army the same day he wrote to general scott the following letter arlington virginia april twenty eighteen sixty one general since my interview with you on the eighteenth instant i have felt that i ought no longer to retain my commission in the army i therefore tender my resignation which i request you will recommend for acceptance it would have been presented at once but for the struggle it has cost me to separate myself from a service to which i have devoted the best years of my life and all the ability i possessed during the whole of that time more than a quarter of a century i have experienced nothing but kindness from my superiors and a most cordial friendship from my comrades to no one general have i been as much indebted as to yourself for uniform kindness and consideration and it has always been my ardent desire to merit your approbation i shall carry to the grave the most grateful recollections of your kind consideration and your name and fame shall always be dear to me save in the defence of my native state i never desire again to draw my sword be pleased to accept my most earnest wishes for the continuance of your happiness and prosperity and believe me most truly yours signed r e lee his resignation was written the same day arlington washington city p o april twenty eighteen sixty one honourable simon cameron secretary of war sir i have the honour to tender the resignation of my command as colonel of the first regiment of cavalry very respectfully your obedient servant r e lee colonel first cavalry to show further his great feeling in thus having to leave the army with which he had been associated so long i give two more letters one to his sister mrs ann marshall of baltimore the other to his brother captain sidney smith lee of the united states navy arlington virginia april twenty eighteen sixty one my dear sister i am grieved at my inability to see you i have been waiting for a more convenient season which has brought to many before me deep and lasting regret now we are in a state of war which will yield to nothing the whole south is in a state of revolution into which virginia after a long struggle 
has been drawn and though i recognise no necessity for this state of things and would have forborne and pleaded to the end for redress of grievances real or supposed yet in my own person i had to meet the question whether i should take part against my native state with all my devotion to the union and the feeling of loyalty and duty of an american citizen i have not been able to make up my mind to raise my hand against my relatives my children my home i have therefore resigned my commission in the army and save in defence of my native state with the sincere hope that my poor services may never be needed i hope i may never be called on to draw my sword i know you will blame me but you must think as kindly of me as you can and believe that i have endeavoured to do what i thought right to show you the feeling and struggle it has cost me i send you a copy of my letter of resignation i have no time for more may god guard and protect you and yours and shower upon you everlasting blessings is the prayer of your devoted brother r e lee arlington virginia april twenty eighteen sixty my dear brother smith the question which was the subject of my earnest consultation with you on the eighteenth instant has in my own mind been decided after the most anxious inquiry as to the correct course for me to pursue i concluded to resign and sent in my resignation this morning i wish to wait till the ordinance of secession should be acted on by the people of virginia but war seems to have commenced and i am liable at any time to be ordered on duty which i could not conscientiously perform to save me from such a position and to prevent the necessity of resigning under orders i had to act at once and before i could see you again on the subject as i had wished i am now a private citizen and have no other ambition than to remain at home save in defence of my native state i have no desire ever again to draw my sword i send you my warmest love your affectionate brother r e lee i will give here one of my father's letters written after the war in which is his account of his resignation from the united states army lexington virginia february twenty five eighteen sixty eight honorable reverdy johnson united states senate washington d c my dear sir my attention has been called to the official report of the debate in the senate of the united states on the nineteenth instant in which you did me the kindness to doubt the correctness of the statement made by the honorable simon cameron in regard to myself i desire that you may feel certain of my conduct on the occasion referred to so far as my individual statement can make you i never intimated to any one that i desired the command of the united states army nor did i ever have a conversation with but one gentleman mr francis preston blair on the subject which was at his invitation and as i understood at the instance of president lincoln after listening to his remarks i declined the offer he made me to take command of the army that was to be brought into the field stating as candidly and as courteously as i could that though opposed to secession and deprecating war i could take no part in an invasion of the southern states i went directly from the interview with mr blair to the office of general scott told him of the proposition that had been made to me and my decision upon reflection after returning to my home i concluded that i ought no longer to retain the commission i held in the united states army and on the second morning thereafter i forwarded my resignation to general scott at the time i hoped that peace would have been preserved that some way would have been found to save the country from the calamities of war and i then had no other intention than to pass the remainder of my life as a private citizen two days afterward upon the invitation of the governor of virginia i repaired to richmond found that the convention then in session had passed the ordinance withdrawing the state from the union and accepted the commission of commander of its forces which was tendered me these are the ample facts of the case and they show that mr cameron has been misinformed i am with great respect your obedient servant r e lee my father reached richmond april twenty second eighteen sixty one 
the next day he was introduced to the virginia convention and offered by then the command of the military forces of his state in his reply to mr john janey the president who spoke for the convention he said mr president and gentlemen of the convention deeply impressed with the solemnity of the occasion on which i appear before you and profoundly grateful for the honour conferred upon me i accept the position your partiality has assigned me though i would greatly have preferred your choice should have fallen on one more capable trusting to almighty god an approving conscience and the aid of my fellow-citizens i will devote myself to the defence and service of my native state in whose behalf alone would i have ever drawn my sword on april twenty sixth from richmond he wrote to his wife i am very anxious about you you have to move and make arrangements to go to some point of safety which you must select the mount vernon plate and pictures ought to be secured keep quiet while you remain and in your preparation war is inevitable and there is no telling when it will burst around you virginia yesterday i understand joined the confederate states what policy they may adopt i cannot conjecture may god bless and preserve you and have mercy upon all our people is the constant prayer of your affectionate husband r e lee on april thirtieth on going to my room last night i found my trunk and sword there and opened them this morning discovered the package of letters and was very glad to learn you were all well and as yet peaceful i fear the latter state will not continue long i think therefore you had better prepare all things for removal that is the plate pictures etc and be prepared at any moment where to go is the difficulty when the war commences no place will be exempt in my opinion and indeed all the avenues into the state will be the scenes of military operations there is no prospect or intention of the government to propose a truce do not be deceived by it may god preserve you all and bring peace to our distracted country again to my mother at arlington richmond may second eighteen sixty one my dear mary i received last night your letter of the first with contents it gave me great pleasure to learn that you were all well and in peace you know how pleased i should be to have you and my dear daughters with me that i fear cannot be there is no place that i can expect to be but in the field and there is no rest for me to look to but i want you to be in a place of safety we have only to be resigned to god's will and pleasure and do all we can for our protection i have just received custis's letter of the thirtieth enclosing the acceptance of my resignation it is stated that it will take effect april twenty fifth i resigned on the twentieth and wished it to take effect that day i cannot consent to its running on further and he must receive no pay if they tender it beyond that day but return the whole if need be from another letter to my mother dated may eighth i grieve at the necessity that drives you from your home i can appreciate your feelings on the occasion and pray that you may receive comfort and strength in the difficulties that surround you when i reflect upon the calamity impending over the country my own sorrows sink into insignificance be content and resigned to god's will i shall be able to write seldom write to me as your letters will be my greatest comfort i send a check for five hundred dollars it is all i have in bank pay the children's school expenses to my mother still at arlington richmond may eleventh eighteen sixty one i have received your letter of the ninth from arlington i had supposed you were at ravensworth i am glad to hear that you are at peace and enjoying the sweet weather and beautiful flowers you had better complete your arrangements and retire further from the scene of war it may burst upon you at any time it is sad to think of the devastation if not ruin it may bring upon a spot so endeared to us but god's will be done we must be resigned may he guard and keep you all is my constant prayer all this time my father was very hard at work 
organizing and equipping the volunteers who were pouring into richmond from the southern states but he was in constant correspondence with my mother helping her all he could in her arrangements for leaving her home his letters show that he thought of everything even the least and he gave the most particular directions about his family their effects the servants the horses the farm pictures plate and furniture being called to norfolk suddenly before going he wrote to my mother richmond may sixteenth eighteen sixty one my dear mary i am called down to norfolk and leave this afternoon i expect to return friday but may be delayed i write to advise you of my absence in case you should not receive answers to any letters that may arrive i have not heard from you since i last wrote nor have i anything to relate i heard from my dear little rob who had an attack of chills and fever he hoped to escape the next paroxysm i witnessed the opening of the convention yesterday footnote the episcopal convention of the diocese of virginia End note. and heard the good bishop footnote bishop mead of virginia End note. sermon being the fiftieth anniversary of his ministry it was a most impressive scene and more than once i felt the tears coming down my cheek it was from the text and pharaoh said unto jacob how old art thou it was full of humility and self-reproach i saw mr walker bishop johns bishop atkinson etc i have not been able to attend any other services and presume the session will not be prolonged i suppose it may be considered a small attendance should custis arrive during my absence i will leave word for him to take my room at the spotswood till my return smith footnote his brother s s lee c s n end note is well and enjoys a ride in the afternoon with mrs stannard the charming women you know always find him out give much love to cousin anna nanny and dear daughters when rob leaves the university take him with you truly and affectionately r e lee by this time my mother and all the family had left arlington my brother custis had joined my father in richmond the girls had gone to fauquier county to visit relatives and my mother to ravensworth about ten miles from arlington towards fairfax court house where her aunt mrs a m fitzhugh lived always considerate of the happiness and comfort of others my father feared that his wife's present at ravensworth might possibly bring annoyance to cousin anna as he called our aunt and he wrote to my mother urging her not to remain there he sympathized with her in having to leave her home which she never saw again richmond may twenty five eighteen sixty one i have been trying dearest mary ever since the receipt of your letter by custis to write to you i sympathize deeply in your feelings at leaving your dear home i have experienced them myself and they are constantly revived i fear we have not been grateful enough for the happiness there within our reach and our heavenly father has found it necessary to deprive us of what he has given us i acknowledge my ingratitude my transgressions and my unworthiness and submit with resignation to what he thinks proper to inflict upon me we must trust all then to him and i do not think it prudent or right for you to return there while the united states troops occupy that country i have gone over all this ground before and have just written to cousin anna on the subject while writing i received a telegram from cousin john goldsboro footnote a cousin of mrs fitzhugh end note, urging your departure south i suppose he is impressed with the risk of your present position and in addition to the possibility or probability of personal annoyance to yourself i fear your presence may provoke annoyance to cousin anna but unless cousin anna goes with you i shall be distressed about her being there alone if the girls went to kenluck or eastern view you and cousin anna might take care of yourselves because you could get in the carriage and go off in an emergency but i really am afraid that you may prove more harm than comfort to her mr william c reeves has just been in to say that if you and cousin anna will go to his house he will be very glad for you to stay as long as you please that his son has a commodious house just opposite his unoccupied partially furnished 
that you could if you prefer take that bring up servants and what you desire and remain there as independent as at home i must now leave the matter to you and pray that god may guard you i have no time for more i know and feel the discomfort of your position but it cannot be helped and we must bear our trials like christians if you and cousin anna choose to come here you know how happy we shall be to see you i shall take the field as soon now as i can ever yours truly and devotedly r e lee three days later he was at manassas only a short distance from ravensworth and he sent her this short note manassas may twenty eighth eighteen sixty one i reached here dearest mary this afternoon i am very much occupied in examining matters and have to go out to look over the ground cousin john tempts me strongly to go down but i never visit for many reasons if for no other to prevent compromising the house for my visit would certainly be known i have written to you fully and to cousin anna i am decidedly of the opinion that it would be better for you to leave on your account and cousin anna's my only objection is the leaving cousin anna alone if she should not go with you if you prefer richmond go with nanny otherwise go to the upper country as john indicates i fear i cannot be with you anywhere i do not think richmond will be permanent truly r i may as well say here that cousin anna never did leave ravensworth during the war she remained there with only a few faithful servants and managed to escape any serious molestation nanny was mrs s s lee who shortly after this time went to richmond on may twenty fifth my father was transferred with all the virginia troops to the confederate states army he ceased to be a major-general and became a brigadier no higher rank having been created as yet in the confederate service later when the rank was created he was made a full general by the end of may to quote from general long lee had organized equipped and sent to the field more than thirty thousand men and various regiments were in a forward state of preparation when the confederate government moved from montgomery to richmond and president davis took charge of all military movements my father was kept near him as his constant and trusted adviser his experience as an engineer was of great service to the young confederacy and he was called upon often for advice for the location of batteries and troops on our different defensive lines in a letter to my mother he speaks of one of these trips to the waters east of richmond richmond june ninth eighteen sixty one i have just returned from a visit to the batteries and troops on james and york rivers etc where i was some days i called a few hours at the white house saw charlotte and annie fitzhugh was away but got out of the cars as i got in our little boy looked very sweet and seemed glad to kiss me a good-bye charlotte said she was going to prepare to leave for the summer but had not determined where to go i could only see some of the servants about the house and the stables they were all well you may be aware that the confederate government is established here yesterday i turned over to it the command of the military and naval forces of the state in accordance with the proclamation of the government and the agreement between the state and the confederate states i do not know what my position will be i should like to retire to private life if i could be with you and the children but if i can be of any service to the state or her cause i must continue mr davis and all his cabinet are here good-bye give much love to kind friends may god guard and bless you them and our suffering country and enable me to perform my duty i think of you constantly write me what you will do direct here always yours r e lee to my mother who was now in fauquier county staying at kenluck mr edward turner's home he writes on june twenty fourth from richmond your future arrangements are the source of much anxiety to me no one can say what is in the future nor is it wise to anticipate evil but it is well to prepare for what may reasonably happen and be provided for the worst there is no saying when you can return to your home or what may be its condition when you do return what then can you do in the meantime to remain with friends may be incumbent and uh, where can you go 
my movements are very uncertain and i wish to take the field as soon as certain arrangements can be made i may go at any moment and to any point where it may be necessary many of our old friends are dropping in e p alexander is here jimmy hill alston jennifer etc and i hear that my old colonel a s johnston is crossing the plains from california as ever r e lee i again quote from a letter to my mother dated richmond july twelfth eighteen sixty one i am very anxious to get into the field but am detained by matters beyond my control i have never heard of the appointment to which you allude of commander-in-chief of the confederate states army nor have i any expectations or wish for it president davis holds that position since the transfer of the military operations in virginia to the authorities of the confederate states i have only occupied the position of a general in that service with the duties devolved on me by the president i have been laboring to prepare and get into the field the virginia troops and to strengthen by those from the other states the threatened commands of johnston beauregard huger garnet etc where i shall go i do not know as that will depend upon president davis as usual in getting through with the thing i have broken down a little and had to take my bed last evening but am at my office this morning and hope will soon be right again my young friend mr vest has just returned from a search in the city for dixie and says he has visited every place in richmond without finding it i suppose it is exhausted always yours r e lee the booksellers say dixie is not to be had in virginia r e l on july twenty first occurred the battle of manassas in a letter to my mother written on the twenty seventh my father says that indeed was a glorious victory and has lightened the pressure upon our front amazingly do not grieve for the brave dead sorrow for those they left behind friends relatives and families the former are at rest the latter must suffer the battle will be repeated there in greater force i hope god will again smile on us and strengthen our hearts and arms i wish to partake in the former struggle and am now mortified at my absence but the president thought it more important i should be here i could not have done as well as has been done but i could have helped and taken part in the struggle for my home and neighbourhood so the work is done i care not by whom it is done i leave to-morrow for the northwest army i wished to go before as i wrote you and was all prepared but the indications were so evident of the coming battle and in the uncertainty of the result the president forbade my departure now it is necessary and he consents i cannot say for how long but will write you i enclose you a letter from markey footnote miss martha custis williams second cousin of my mother afterward mrs admiral carter u s n End note. write to her if you can and thank her for her letter to me i have not time my whole time is occupied and all my thoughts and strength are given to the cause to which my life be it long or short will be devoted tell her not to mind the reports she sees in the papers they are made to injure and occasion distrust those that know me will not believe them those that do not will not care for them i laugh at them give love to all and for yourself accept the constant prayers and love of truly yours r e lee it was thought best at this time to send general lee to take command of military operations in west virginia the ordinary difficulties of a campaign in this country of mountains and bad roads were greatly increased by incessant rains sickness of all kinds amongst the new troops and the hostility of many of the inhabitants to the southern cause my father's letters which i will give here tell of his trials and troubles and describe at the same time the beauty of scenery and some of the military movements about august first he started for his new command and he writes to my mother on his arrival at huntersville pocahontas county now west virginia huntersville august fourth eighteen sixty one i reached here yesterday dearest mary to visit this portion of the army the day after my arrival at staunton i set off for monterey where the army of general garnett's command is stationed 
two regiments and a field battery occupy the allegheny mountains in advance about thirty miles and this division guards the road to staunton the division here guards the road leading by the warm springs to millboro and covington two regiments are advanced about twenty eight miles to middle mountain fitzhugh footnote major w h f lee general lee's second son end note with his squadron is between that point and this i have not seen him i understand he is well south of here again is another column of our enemies making their way up the kanawha valley and from general wise's report are not far from lewisburg their object seems to be to get possession of the virginia central railroad and the virginia and tennessee railroad by the first they can approach richmond by the last interrupt our reinforcements from the south the points from which we can be attacked are numerous and their means are unlimited so we must always be on the alert my uneasiness on these points brought me out here it is so difficult to get our people unaccustomed to the necessities of war to comprehend and promptly execute the measures required for the occasion general jackson of georgia commands on the monterey line general loring on this line and general wise supported by general floyd on the kanawha line the soldiers everywhere are sick the measles are prevalent throughout the whole army and you know that disease leaves unpleasant results attacks on the lungs typhoid etc especially in camp where accommodations for the sick are poor i travelled from staunton on horseback a part of the road as far as buffalo gap i passed over in the summer of eighteen forty on my return to st louis after bringing you home if any one had then told me that the next time i travelled that road would have been on my present errand i should have supposed him insane i enjoyed the mountains as i rode along the views are magnificent the valleys so beautiful the scenery so peaceful what a glorious world almighty god has given us how thankless and ungrateful we are and how we labour to mar his gifts i hope you received my letter from richmond give love to daughters and mildred i did not see rob as i passed through charlottesville he was at the university and i could not stop a few days later there is another letter camp at valley mountain august ninth eighteen sixty one i have been here dear mary three days coming from monterey to huntersville and thence here we are on the dividing ridge looking north down the tiger river valley whose waters flow into the monongahela and south towards the elk river and greenbrier flowing into the kanawha in the valley north of us lie huttonsville and beverly occupied by our invaders and the rich mountains west the scene of our former disaster and the cheat mountains east their present stronghold are in full view the mountains are beautiful fertile to the tops covered with the richest sward of bluegrass and white clover the enclosed fields waving with the natural growth of timothy the habitations are few and population sparse this is a magnificent grazing country and all it needs is labour to clear the mountain sides of its great growth of timber there surely is no lack of moisture at this time it has rained i believe some portion of every day since i left staunton now it is pouring and the wind having veered around to every point of the compass has settled down to the northeast what that portends in these regions i do not know colonel washington footnote john augustine washington great nephew of general washington and mount vernon's last owner bearing the name End note. colonel washington captain taylor and myself are in one tent which as yet protects us i have enjoyed the company of fitzhugh since i have been here he is very well and very active and as yet the war has not reduced him much he dined with me yesterday and preserved his fine appetite to-day he is out reconnoitring and has the full benefit of this rain i fear he is without his overcoat as i do not recollect seeing it on his saddle i told you he had been promoted to a major in cavalry and is the commanding cavalry officer on this line at present he is as sanguine cheerful and hearty as ever i sent him some corn-meal this morning and he sent me some butter a mutual interchange of good things 
there are but few of your acquaintances in this army i find here in the ranks of one company henry tiffany the company is composed principally of baltimoreans george lemon and douglas mercer are in it it is a very fine company well drilled and well instructed i find that our old friend j j reynolds of west point memory is in command of the troops immediately in front of us he is a brigadier general you may recollect him as the assistant professor of philosophy and lived in the cottage beyond the west gate with his little pale-faced wife a great friend of lawrence and markey he resigned on being relieved from west point and was made professor of some college in the west fitzhugh was the bearer of a flag the other day and he recognized him he was very polite and made kind inquiries of us all i am told they feel very safe and are very confident of success their numbers are said to be large ranging from twelve thousand to thirty thousand but it is impossible for me to get correct information either as to their strength or position our citizens beyond this are all on their side our movements seem to be rapidly communicated to them while theirs come to us slowly and indistinctly i have two regiments here with others coming up i think we shall shut up this road to the central railroad which they strongly threaten our supplies come up slowly we have plenty of beef and can get some bread i hope you are well and are content i have heard nothing of you or the children since i left richmond you must write there the men are suffering from the measles etc as elsewhere but are cheerful and light-hearted the atmosphere when it is not raining is delightful you must give some love to daughter and life footnote pet names for his two daughters mary and mildred End note. i want to see you very much but i know not when this can be may god guard and protect you all in him alone is our hope remember me to ned footnote mr edward carter turner of kinlock my father's cousin End note. and all at kinlock and avenel note avenel the house of the burbleys in farquhar county End note. send word to miss lou washington note, eldest daughter of john augustin washington End note, that her father is sitting on his blanket sewing the strap on his haversack i think she ought to be here to do it always yours r e lee in a letter to his two daughters who were in richmond he writes valley mountain august twenty nine eighteen sixty one my precious daughters i have just received your letters of the twenty fourth and am rejoiced to hear that you are well and enjoying the company of your friends it rains here all the time literally there has not been sunshine enough since my arrival to dry my clothes perry footnote his servant had been in the dining-room at arlington End note, is my washerman and socks and towels suffer but the worst of the rain is that the ground has become so saturated with water that the constant travel on the roads has made them almost impassable so that i cannot get up sufficient supplies for the troops to move it is raining now has been all day last night day before and day before that etc etc but we must be patient it is quite cool too i have on all my winter clothes and am riding in my overcoat all the clouds seem to concentrate over this ridge of mountains and by whatever wind they are driven give us rain the mountains are magnificent the sugar maples are beginning to turn already and the grass is luxuriant richmond footnote his horse End note, has not been accustomed to such fare or such treatment but he gets along tolerably complains some and has not much superfluous flesh there has been some sickness among the men measles etc and the weather has been unfavourable i hope their attacks are nearly over and that they will come out with the sun our party has kept well although we may be too weak to break through the lines i feel well satisfied that the enemy cannot at present reach richmond by either of these routes leading to staunton milborough or covington he must find some other way god bless you my children and preserve you from all harm is the constant prayer of your devoted father r e lee on account of rheumatism my mother was anxious to go to the hot springs in bath county 
she was now staying at audley clark county virginia with mrs lorenzo lewis who had just sent her six sons into the army bath county was not very far from the seat of war in western virginia and my father was asked as to the safety of the hot springs from occupation by the enemy he writes as follows to my mother valley mountain september one eighteen sixty one i have received dearest mary your letter of august eighteenth from audley and i am very glad to get news of your whereabouts i am very glad you are enabled to see so many of your friends i hope you have found all well in your tour and am very glad that our cousin esther bears the separation from all her sons so bravely i have no doubt they will do good service in our southern cause and wish they could be placed according to their fancies i fear you have postponed your visit to the hot too late it must be quite cold there now judging from the temperature here and it has been raining in these mountains since july twenty fourth i see fitzhugh quite often though he is encamped four miles from me he is very well and not at all harmed by the campaign we have a great deal of sickness among the soldiers and now those on the sick list would form an army the measles is still among them though i hope it is dying out but it is a disease which though light in childhood is severe in manhood and prepares the system for other attacks the constant cold rains with no shelter but tents have aggravated it all these drawbacks with impassable roads have paralyzed our efforts still i think you will be safe at the hot for the present we are right up to the enemy on the three lines and in the kanawha he has been pushed beyond the gali my poor little rob i never hear from scarcely he is busy i suppose and knows not where to direct with much affection r e lee from the same camp to my mother on september the ninth i hope from the tone of your letter that you feel better and wish i could see you and be with you i trust we may meet this fall somewhere if only for a little time i have written to robert telling him if after considering what i have previously said to him on the subject of his joining the company he desires under major ross he still thinks it best for him to do so i will not withhold my consent it seems he will be eighteen i thought seventeen i am unable to judge for him and he must decide for himself in reply to a recent letter from him to me on the same subject i said to him all i could i pray god to bring him to a right conclusion for military news i must refer you to the papers you will see there more than ever occurs and what does occur the relation must be taken with some allowance do not believe anything you see about me there has been no battle only skirmishing with the outposts and nothing done of any moment the weather is still unfavorable to us the roads or rather tracks of mud are almost impassable and the number of sick large truly and devotedly yours r e lee my mother was at the hot springs i had taken her there and was with her i don't now remember why but it was decided that i should return to the university of virginia which opened october first and continue my course there while at the springs my mother received this letter from my father valley mount september seventeenth eighteen sixty one i received dear mary your letter of the fifth by beverly turner footnote a son of mr edward turner of kinlock end note who is a nice young soldier i am pained to see fine young men like him of education and standing from all the old and respectable families in the state serving in the ranks i hope in time they will receive their reward i met him as i was returning from an expedition to the enemy's works which i had hoped to have surprised on the morning of the twelfth both at cheat mountain and on valley river all the attacking parties with great labor had reached their destination over mountains considered impassable to bodies of troops notwithstanding a heavy storm that set in the day before and raged all night in which they had to stand up till daylight their arms were then unserviceable and they in poor condition for a fierce assault against artillery and superior numbers 
after waiting till ten o'clock for the assault on cheat mountain which did not take place and which was to have been the signal for the rest they were withdrawn and after waiting three days in front of the enemy hoping he would come out of his trenches we returned to our position at this place i cannot tell you my regret and mortification at the untoward events that caused the failure of the plan i had taken every precaution to ensure success and counted on it but the ruler of the universe willed otherwise and sent a storm to disconcert a well-laid plan and to destroy my hopes we are no worse off now than before except the disclosure of our plan against which they will guard we met with one heavy loss which grieves me deeply colonel washington accompanied fitzhugh on a reconnoitring expedition and i fear they were carried away by their zeal and approached within the enemy's pickets the first they knew was a volley from a concealed party within a few yards of them their balls passed through the colonel's body then struck fitzhugh's horse and the horse of one of the men was killed fitzhugh mounted the colonel's horse and brought him off i am much grieved he was always anxious to go on these expeditions this was the first day i assented since i had been thrown into such intimate relations with him i had learned to appreciate him very highly morning and evening have i seen him on his knees praying to his maker the righteous perisheth and no man layeth it to heart and merciful men are taken away none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come may god have mercy on us all i suppose you are at the hot springs and will direct to you there our poor sick i know suffer much they bring it on themselves by not doing what they are told they are worse than children for the latter can be forced truly yours r e lee on the same day he wrote to the governor of virginia valley mountain september seventeenth eighteen sixty one my dear governor i received your very kind note of the fifth instant just as i was about to accompany general loring's command on an expedition to the enemy's works in front or i would have before thanked you for the interest you take in my welfare and your too flattering expressions of my ability indeed you overrate me much and i feel humbled when i weigh myself by your standard i am however very grateful for your confidence and i can answer for my sincerity in the earnest endeavour i make to advance the cause i have so much at heart though conscious of the slow progress i make i was very sanguine of taking the enemy's works on last thursday morning i had considered the subject well with great effort the troops intended for the surprise had reached their destination having traversed twenty miles of steep rugged mountain paths and the last day through a terrible storm which lasted all night and in which they had to stand drenched to the skin in cold rain still their spirits were good when morning broke i could see the enemy's tents on valley river at the point on the huttonsville road just below me it was a tempting sight we waited for the attack on cheat mountain which was to be the signal till ten a m the men were cleaning their unserviceable arms but the signal did not come all chance for a surprise was gone the provisions of the men had been destroyed the preceding day by the storm they had nothing to eat that morning could not hold out another day and were obliged to be withdrawn the party sent to cheat mountain to take that in rear had also to be withdrawn the attack to come off from the east side failed from the difficulties in the way the opportunity was lost and our plan discovered it is a grievous disappointment to me i assure you but for the rainstorm i have no doubt it would have succeeded this governor is for your own eye please do not speak of it we must try again our greatest loss is the death of my dear friend colonel washington he and my son were reconnoitring the front of the enemy they came unawares upon a concealed party who fired upon them within twenty yards and the colonel fell pierced by three balls my son's horse received three shots but he escaped on the colonel's horse his zeal for the cause to which he had devoted himself carried him i fear too far we took some seventy prisoners and killed some twenty-five or thirty of the enemy our loss was small besides what i have mentioned our greatest difficulty is the roads 
it has been raining in these mountains about six weeks it is impossible to get along it is that which has paralyzed all our efforts with sincere thanks for your good wishes i am very truly yours r e lee his excellency governor john letcher End of chapter two